good day and welcome to all of you to this event joining us from all over the world thank you so much i am puneet oza executive director of singapore chamber of maritime arbitration scma and i'm delighted to see all of you at this event on hybrid dispute resolution mechanisms as the wave of the future perspective from singapore as a maritime hub scma is proud to host this event in strategic partnership with oon and bazul and singapore international mediation center simc as a part of singapore convention week 2021 let me start with a few housekeeping rules i believe most of you are quite familiar and comfortable with the features of zoom please do use the q and a function for any comments and queries at the end of the event we'll flash a qr code with a request for your feedback which is vital to us i would like to start by thanking ministry of law for all their help and support in organizing and planning this event our sincere thanks to minister mr edwin tong sc for agreeing to deliver the opening remarks for this event mr edwin tong sc is the minister for culture community and youth and second minister for law at the ministry of law he focuses on the development and promotion of singapore's legal and dispute resolution sector he also handles wide ranging aspects of law reform including intellectual property corporate restructuring and insolvency and legal aid before taking office mr tong practiced at allen and gladhill where he was concurrently head of restructuring and corporate insolvency department co-head of the litigation and dispute resolution department and a member of the exco he was appointed senior counsel in 2015 we look forward to your opening remarks minister can we please have the video thank you puneet for the kind introduction chairperson vice chairpersons members of the scma board of directors panelists of today's webinar friends and colleagues distinguished guests ladies and gentlemen a very good day to all of you joining us from all over the world let me start by expressing my appreciation to scma for being one of the supporting organizations of this year's singapore convention week 2021 it's been a very exciting week for all of us and hopefully for you too as participants this is of course a very different singapore convention week from the one we had in 2019 where we welcome more than 1600 delegates from 70 countries to singapore but this is reflective of the times we are in and we are very happy to be able to meet everyone nonetheless albeit virtually it goes without saying that the world has turned topsy turvy due to the pandemic the shipping and maritime industry is one of the industries which has felt the impact of covid-19 very keenly because of the various restrictions imposed by countries to maintain the spread of the virus ports were closed containers and vessels from ports of high risk countries were banned crews were subject to quarantine periods and port workers could not work or had to be subject to staggered work schedules supply chains were disrupted there were massive delays this resulted in unfulfilled deliveries transportation delays shipbuilding and ship repair delays time and monetary losses by charter parties and gave rise to more disputes in this period this itself can be seen from the statistics the london maritime arbitrators association or lmaa reported 3010 arbitrator appointments in 2020 which is the highest number of lma arbitrator appointments since 2015 scma saw a 5% increase in its case load in 2020 with more than half the disputants coming from outside singapore when disputes occur it is in the interest of parties to have them speedily and conclusively resolved so that they can move forward arbitration is traditionally used in resolving maritime disputes for a number of reasons first the resolution of maritime disputes require highly specialized knowledge such as on maritime adventure bills of lading maritime liens ship and sister ship arrests parties would therefore prefer an arbitral tribunal which comprises not only those qualified in the law but also experts with shipping or other relevant background and that's why scma boasts an international panel of about 120 maritime arbitrators from at least 15 countries and also plans to offer a specialized maritime arbitrator accreditation program to empanel new arbitrators so that parties will have greater confidence in them 
Second, certain cases also require specialized procedures which arbitral institutions can offer. For example, SCMA launched an expedited arbitral determination of collision claims in 2013 for ship collisions involving expert determination. It provides a fair, timely, and also cost-effective means of determining liability for a collision when negotiations on apportionment of liability might have reached an impasse. Third, most maritime disputes are cross-border in nature. Arbitration renders awards that are enforceable in 168 contracting states to the New York Convention. Singapore has developed our arbitration landscape over the years to support disputing parties, including liberalising our regime to allow parties to choose counsel and arbitrators of any nationality and to use any governing law, updating our legislative framework regularly to keep pace with international best practices and also setting up SCMA in 2004, of course, because we recognise that the maritime community requires a specialist forum to resolve their disputes. This is necessary to support Singapore as the world's top maritime centre for the eighth year running. Singapore is now ranked as the most preferred arbitration seat in the world alongside London in the 2021 Queen Mary University of London White and Case International Arbitration Survey. But arbitration is not the only way to resolve disputes. Beyond arbitration, businesses may increasingly look to avoid escalation of disputes through mediation or hybrid solutions like ArpMedUp. SEMA has introduced the ArpMedUp protocol with the Singapore Mediation Centre, SMC, and the Singapore International Mediation Centre, SIMC, in 2015. It allows parties to commence an arbitration, to stay the arbitration, and to try and resolve the dispute through mediation. And if it is resolved, the mediated settlement agreement is converted to an arbitral award, which can then be enforced under the New York Convention. It combines the benefits of both mediation and arbitration, time and cost savings, and more importantly, preservation of business relationships, as well as the finality and enforceability of an arbitral award. While we now have the Singapore Convention on Mediation to enforce mediated settlement agreements internationally, it will take some time for it to become as powerful an enforcement tool as the New York Convention. 54 countries have signed since the Convention opened for signature in Singapore two years ago. This is promising and we hope more will come on board soon. But hybrid solutions are also not without their challenges. There are issues to be ironed out in order for them to take off and become well used. So for example, interim relief. If a party requires urgent interim relief during the mediation phase, the question remains as to whether, and if so, to whom such relief should be addressed. If this cannot be resolved within mediation, a party may have to terminate mediation to regain access to the arbitral tribunal for an order for interim relief. Second, the neutrals in a hybrid process. While both arbitration and mediation are confidential, mediation may prime parties to be more candid with the mediator than they may be in an arbitration. If the mediation fails and goes to arbitration, this may cause parties to fear that the arbitrator uses shared information against them in the arbitral award. Of course, this is a problem only if the same person is both the arbitrator and the mediator. So for us, we recommend using a different neutral. But this practice differs internationally, and there are some who stipulate that a neutral should remain the same person in both arbitration or mediation. Next, complexity of multi-tiered clauses. A hybrid clause is often more complex than a pure arbitration or mediation clause. Unclear or ambiguous contract clauses may cause problems in commencing the subsequent arbitration or mediation proceedings and might affect the recognition of the enforcement of the award. These are just some examples, and I'll leave the panellists to debate these issues in greater detail later. They are all experts in their fields, with extensive experience in dispute resolution or maritime work. So thank you once again for inviting me to speak, and I wish everyone a very fruitful discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Tong, for those kind and knowledgeable words. We truly appreciate your time and your thoughts. We are extremely thankful to Oon and Bazul for their support and especially its managing partner, Mr. Bazul Shah, for the strategic role that he has played for this event. It's my pleasure to introduce him and other panelists for what promises to be a fascinating and enlightening discussion. Chairing this discussion is Mr. Bazul Shah. He is Oon and Bazul 
LLP's managing partner and head of dispute resolution. He's also an ambassador to the Singapore International Mediation Center panel. He's well regarded for his expertise in resolving cross-border disputes and is also highly experienced in fraud and asset recovery claims. He's a specialist in securing freezing and disclosure orders to trace, preserve, and recover assets. He was ranked Singapore Managing Partner of the Year by Asia Legal Business and is ranked one of the Singapore's top 100 lawyers by Asia Business Law Journal. Leading legal publications such as Chambers Asia Pacific and Legal 500 Asia Pacific have recognized him as an exceptional lawyer. It is an honor to have you chairing this discussion, Bazul. Thank you so much. Next panelist is Mr. Jayesh Ashar, managing partner of K. Ashar & Co., which is one of the leading law firms of advocates and solicitors in India and having a practice of over 48 years. <clears throat> Mr. Asher is a commerce graduate honors from Jai Hind College, Mumbai, and has thereafter qualified as a law graduate from Government Law College, Mumbai University. He has enrolled with the Bar Council. He has been enrolled with the Bar Council of Maharashtra in Goa in the year 1990, and is also a practicing solicitor registered with the Incorporated Law Society India. Mr. Jayesh Asher is an advocate on record Supreme Court of India, as well as Supreme Court of England and Wales. It's a pleasure, Mr. Asher, to have you on board for this event. Welcome. Next, we have Mr. Chuan Weimeng, CEO of Singapore International Mediation Center, SIMC. Weimeng is an experienced lawyer with more than 30 years. Prior to joining SIMC, he has served as general counsel of IBM Greater China and Norton Networks Asia Pacific for about 20 years. Leveraging his deep regional expertise, he is currently leading SIMC to promote mediation to resolve complex commercial cross-border disputes in Asia Pacific region. Weimeng is an accredited mediator of the Singapore International Mediation Institute. He graduated with a law degree from National University of Singapore and holds a master of laws from the University of Hong Kong. He's called to the Singapore Bar and Hong Kong's role of solicitors. Thanks, Weimeng, to you and to SIMC for your strategic partnership and support. Welcome. In order to bring a commercial perspective to this discussion, we are extremely pleased to welcome Mr. Nicholas Fell, Executive Vice President, Corporate Services and General Counsel, BW Group, and also a member, I must say proudly, of SCMA's Local Users Council. Nick joined BW on 9th January 2012 as Head of Corporate Services and General Counsel and holds responsibility for legal, insurance, corporate secretarial and communications departments. He holds an MBA in finance from University of Chicago, a Master's of Law from University of Leicester and a Bachelor's of Law from University of Liverpool. He's admitted to practice law in England, New York, California and Hong Kong. Nick is currently a director of North of England p &I Association and of Knopf Energy Solutions SA and is the chairman of the BIMCO Documentary Committee. He's also a fellow of the Singapore Institute of Media Arbitrators, sorry, Singapore Institute of Arbitrators and an associate mediator at the Singapore Mediation Center. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with us, Nick. We are also pleased to welcome Mr. Prakash Silvam. Prakash is a partner in Urun Bazul LP's litigation and dispute resolution practice. He specializes in commercial litigation and arbitration with a focus on international commodity trade, trade finance, marine insurance, and dry bulk shipping. He regularly represents banks, and financiers in multi-jurisdictional enforcements and frequently acts for marine insurance and for insurance claimants. He regularly advise, advises clients on sanctions related matters, including the impact of US, EU and UN sanctions on businesses based in the region. He has also acted as counsel in international arbitrations, both ad hoc and institutional. Prakash is a member of the Grain and Free, Free Trade Association, GAFTA. As always, it's great to have you on board, Prakash. We are also delighted to welcome Ms. Bo Yang, who is a partner in Jing Tian and Gong Cheng. Ms. Yang was admitted to PRC Bar in 2007. She joined Jing Tian and Gong Cheng since January 2020 as a partner. Prior to this, she worked over 10 years with Wang Jing and Co as a partner. Ms. Yang specializes mainly in the areas of international trade, maritime engineering, international commercial arbitration and litigation, maritime and admiralty, logistics, insurance, corporate and commercial, and foreign investment. 
She was acknowledged by the Ministry of Justice of the PRC as one of the nation's top 1,000 international business lawyers, honored by the National Bar Association as the leading international business lawyer and nominated by Euromoney as Women in Business Law Awards 2021 Asia China International Trade. Welcome, Ms. Yang, to this August panel. Finally, I too am privileged to be a part of this panel and hopefully will provide some views from commercial as well as SCMA's perspective. Over to you, Bazul, to chair this discussion. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. Thank you, Puneet. Um, you know, I would like to extend a very warm welcome and thank everyone for joining this webinar today on hybrid dispute resolution mechanism which is part of the Singapore Ministry of Laws, Singapore Convention Week. You know, we in Singapore are honored and at the same time humbled by the trust that Ancitral and the countries who have signed the convention, as well as those who have ratified, have placed in us to play an important role in resolving commercial disputes. So far, 54 countries have signed up to the convention within two years. As a comparison, New York Convention, 24 countries signed up in the first two years. I believe the force driving up the acceptance of the Singapore Convention is also the acceptance of mediation as an important, sophisticated dispute resolution tool rather than seen as a poorer cousin of arbitration and litigation. The commercial users demand that their disputes are resolved quickly and cost efficiently without leaving a trail of destruction through the adversarial process. This is particularly true in the context of maritime disputes. This is the thinking behind the design of hybrid dispute resolution clauses, including SCMA, SIMC, arbitration, mediation, arbitration protocol. Now, in a recent Singapore International Dispute Resolution Academy survey, it was revealed that the top three factors influencing parties to choose hybrid dispute resolution over arbitration are preservation of business relationship, efficiency and cost. You know, what I want to do with the panelists today is to assess the suitability of hybrid dispute resolution mechanism for maritime cases, utilization of experiences from practitioners from China and India with the um, hybrid dispute resolution clauses, and also touch on the enforcement of any potential mediated settlement with the coming in place of the Singapore Convention, and possibly also crystal ball gazing into the future of hybrid dispute resolution mechanism for resolving maritime dispute. With that, um, I think it is useful to kickstart this panel discussion with an idea of what hybrid, hybrid dispute resolution clause mechanism is. Before I, want, before I engage SCMA panel, uh, representative Puneet and SIMC representative Weiming, uh, maybe Prakash, could you let us know very briefly, how hybrid dispute resolution mechanism clause is meant to work? So it is a combination of arbitration and mediation. Uh, there are various forms of a hybrid clause, but generally speaking, what happens is the party uh, sends a, a notice of arbitration. Uh, there is a response to it. The tribunal is appointed, uh, but the arbitration is stayed uh, to give the parties an opportunity to try and mediate and settle the dispute. And you, uh, mm. usually a, a specific, within a specific frame of time, and if the parties 
uh, settle, then that settlement will be recorded as a consent award by the uh, arbitrator. And if there is no settlement, then that proceeds, uh, uh, the dispute proceeds in the arbitration itself. Thank you. Now, um, Pune, uh, this is to you. Uh, I know that SCMA has incorporated SCMA SIMC up met up protocol uh, in your recommended standard clauses. Now, what I want to uh, maybe tease out is how those, that protocol is meant to work and what's the thinking behind it and how what would you say to encourage uh, users to adopt that? Thank you, Basul. I think the, uh, the protocol with SIMC is a very important tool for the parties to be able to manage the process. Being a self-administered model that SCMA has, we actually allow complete party autonomy to manage that process themselves. And as Prakash rightly said, the protocol works exactly like that, that the arbitration is commenced. You have a notification, you have a response, you have a tribunal appointed. At some point of time, it is quite possible that the parties may actually change or the perception of the strength of their case may change. They may actually start to appreciate the arguments of the other parties' uh, point of view and thereby consider looking at a settlement or a mediation. At that stage, a protocol like this will give a time-bound way of going out and approaching SIMC. And the protocol allows a specific number of weeks within which the mediation must be looked at. And then obviously, if the settlement does take place, as uh, it's mentioned, it can be converted into an award. If it does not happen and the settlement does not take place, you can come right back and continue with arbitration. This is a way of reducing the costs preserving relationships. And most importantly, because of our model, we don't have any sunken costs upfront. So this is basically a very cost effective way of parties to try and maybe look at sol solving the problem in the best possible manner, which is exactly what we are trying to offer as a solution, as a dispute resolution center. And so is SIMC. So I think it's a win-win partnership, which benefits parties tremendously. Yeah. That's very interesting. I I'm going to pick up from uh, what you said, because towards the end, you were emphasizing on cost. Of course, cost is a very important aspect, especially now um, in, 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 in considering how far someone takes the dispute further. Now, what, and this is directed at Nick, uh, you know, from a user's perspective, you know, one of the things which troubles me um, in terms of adopting mediation for maritime cases is I find that there is a large number of cases which is not very high in value. So from a cost uh, effective perspective, from a user perspective, do you think the users will adopt mediation to resolve their disputes. Um, well, th thank you very much and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, definitely in, in the space that I practice in, uh, which is shipping and, and commercial, we see increasing uptake uh, of uh, mediation. Um, and I've actually yet to meet somebody uh, who has been through a mediation um, who has said it wasn't worth the time or effort or cost. Um, the cost is pretty trivial in my experience compared with um, the alternative, which is a, a court case or an arbitration. Um, and the, arbitra the uh, mediator's fees are typically um, very reasonable um, and the mediation is often done, usually done actually in, in a day or if it isn't complete in a day, um, sometimes an active mediator can cajole the parties and a week or two or three weeks later um, end up resolving the situation. Um, I would also like to, uh, to mention one other aspect which I really 
like about the ARB med ARB clause developed here in Singapore. And that is that I have met people from time to time who um, uh, may regard it as a sign of weakness in the normal arbitration uh, process or court process to go to the other side and say, hey, let's have a mediation. Um, sometimes people perceive that as a signal that they have a weaker case than, than they're putting on. Um, I, I don't agree with that, um, but I do think that having the clause as it is, it embeds the concept psychologically into um, the minds of both parties. And so uh, it's there in the document, minds focus on it fairly early, and it sweeps away any loss of face argument or um, psychological dissonance you might have in raising the, the, the concept. Sounds a little bit abstract, but I've certainly seen that in practice. No, Nick, I mean, it's not abstract at all because uh, we are all confronted by this because uh, I can tell you, I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, one of the things which uh, sometimes uh, I find difficult to put across is uh, to deal with a client who then says, hang on, uh, mediation, I'm all for it. It's all, I have all this cost saving um, element to it but I don't want to be the first one to raise the suggestion of a mediation. They seem to think raising the suggestion of a mediation is raising a white flag. So it is very real. And out of 10 situations, nine situations I have to explain to my client, it is not raising the white flag. You know, so what you said is it's, it's very real. Very interesting. Um, you know, before, maybe maybe I do want to uh, touch on this uh, perception of uh, raising the white flag. Uh, maybe, maybe let me call on Weeming. Weeming, how do you deal with this? I mean, uh, from your institution SIMC's perspective, obviously you want more users to um, deploy mediation as quickly as possible. So how, how, do, you, how do you encourage uh, practitioners to sell this idea to their clients? Okay, thank, thanks, uh, Bazu um, and Pune. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I think with regard to selling it to the parties, um, that's where SIMC can play a really important role. I, I completely understand from a psychological perspective, the parties are concerned that if they raise or they, if they ask their counsel to raise to the other counsel, the prospect of mediation is seen as potentially um, a weakness. So what SIMC does is that we approach both sides equally and say, would you want to consider mediation? And we then can be a neutral party to take away the edge of any uh, concern that this is seen as a weakness. And in doing so, um, we've found that parties and council are really more amenable to it because it is a neutral party like SIMC doing so. Um, so we've played that role, um, what we call uh, mediation support, uh, whether it is pre-mediation as part of our, our prospect of going out to different parties and, and, and law firms to do that. So that's, we've done that in the past. And the other thing that we do is also to help the parties, like you say, consider that even considering mediation is not a, a, a sign of weakness. And, and let me explain why. Um, maritime is obviously a very small circle, right? <laughs> I mean, almost everybody know each other. You go to the same conferences, you see each other, you see go to the clubs, you see each other. Um, um, I mean the golf clubs, okay? <laughs> you see each other. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, we are amongst a group of very close-knit friends, acquaintances, colleagues. So it's a very strong community and they support each other. In a mediation, the beauty of it is that you are no longer just providing uh, or, 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 or delegating the, the, the issue to your lawyer. They're still very, very important but you are also involved in that process in the mediation itself. 
a lot more than perhaps in an arbitration where you where you only probably go you know, on the witness box and, and provide your case. Here you are actively involved in the negotiation, which is where you know that relationship is so critical. And, and why I say it's not a it's not a weakness is because you know it is part of building that community. Uh, let me give you one beautiful quote I received from a party after a successful mediation. He say, I may or may not have a friend, but I have one less enemy. I think that was precious. <laughs> I may or may not have a friend, but I have one less enemy. And that's so important in this community that we have is that we support each other and we grow together. And that's where um, mediation has that ability to do so. And it may, if I may add one more point, and that is when it comes to institutional mediation, Ahmed Art, for example, where the matter is transferred from SCMA to SIMC, you can be assured of confidentiality, 100%. You don't have to be afraid that whatever that's disclosed, that's talked about at the mediation will somehow get into the arbitration. You have 100% protection. And, and therefore, the parties are more willing to involve. They are more willing to, to offer solutions, creative solutions. They are more willing to talk to each other with and with, uh, with their lawyer support. And, and that is really how we try to build this whole community of um, mediation. And we've seen a lot of success over the last uh, couple of years and happy to talk about that a little later. Thank you. Yes. Now, uh, you know, just to round up on the, on the perception of weakness, I mean, Beaming was brilliant in terms of uh, uh, setting the ecosystem and the, and, and the knowledge of the practitioners within that ecosystem to dispel the suggestion of mediation. But now, uh, even before um, that notion comes in, sometimes even though we know each other, the clients, as Nick said, the clients themselves may not be comfortable enough because the, the practitioners may be comfortable, but the clients may not be. So I, I'm not sure, Puneet, I mean, maybe this is to you. Uh, from SEMA's perspective, uh, do you already have a system where you send out a standard letter out to those who are involved in an arbitration to say, guys, I mean, you have this option of mediating. Do you want to consider mediation? And we have this protocol uh, with SIMC. Uh, do you want to adopt it? You don't need to adopt it, but uh, you may want to consider mediation um, because it's a design, isn't it? Hybrid dispute resolution mechanism is a design. So you can insert it right at the contract stage. Just because it's not in the contract stage, it does not mean it's a death knell to it. So you can come in and, you know, if it's a letter process, I'm not sure what is SCMA's thinking on this. Sure. Um, so I, I agree with you, Basil, that we are basically uh, needing to educate the users as much as possible. I think a discussion like this helps a lot. Whenever we market SCMA, we expressly talk about the value of the ArbMed Up protocol. I generally believe, having come, come from a commercial perspective, a commercial background myself, I believe that Sometimes when you start the arbitration, you start getting a bit more perspective as well as the understanding of the case overall. You are getting the other person's point of view. So you need to kickstart that process with an arbitration um, and then maybe look at the way of settling down. At, this, at that point of time, at the starting point, you may not actually be there to settle the case or resolve it through mediation. So the ARB Met ARB is a very useful tool to manage that process. And you're 100% correct that we should actually uh, be able to uh, get into this protocol, even if you have not incorporated it into your contract, you can do that. Parties are fully free to do that. The only advantage with incorporating it into your contract is that then both the parties are basically already set with this idea, which Nick mentioned about the, the way the parties think psychologically comes into play as well. Uh, and the other point is that most of the time when a dispute does happen, one of the parties perceives that he may or may not, he or she may not have that case. So 
obviously they try and not agree to any kind of suggestions from the other party so if it if it becomes combative for any reason then it becomes a challenge from that perspective which is why incorporating it right at the pre contractual stage which probably help a lot we do not send out a letter or anything like that because we are not involved in the actual management of the administration of the arbitration but maybe it's an idea to try and at least educate the parties as they come to us uh, to say that these are all options available on the table why don't you try and look at it so from that perspective yes it's all about creating greater awareness and also highlighting the win win situation in this which is what i like it the most that it actually solves the problem keeps the parties together preserves relationships and it's very cost effective at the same time so it it ticks a lots of boxes for parties who really want to solve problems if you want to just be combative then obviously there's not much that can be done by either one or the other party yep i think the combative souls <laughs> may lose their place in dispute resolution uh sooner than later i think because uh the client uh is sophisticated enough he wants his problem to be resolved as quickly so if you think posturing uh and adopting a combative approach is to is is the way to impress the client i think i think you may lose your place uh, in that universe fairly quickly i think from I, i i mean speaking of experience from experience now um uh, you know there's another point which i want to uh tease out maybe maybe starting with nick and then i want to move to the experts which you know we have placed on the panel from uh jurisdiction wise ms yang mr asher now so uh nick and i thought maritime of course there are very large value claims in 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 maritime disputes especially now with the collapses of trading companies we are we are seeing them coming into play but there are also smaller value claims i want to get your feel um uh, on you know do we do, is it better to have an evaluative mediation in the non binding or binding i i want to hear from you uh as opposed to a facilitative where a mediator comes in evaluates the claim on the merits as opposed to just playing the neutral if you like uh you know or wearing an expert and saying that i am the expert i've looked at it and i think this case has to be resolved on a finding of law or a technical finding this is how what i think it is what what is your take on it nick yeah um i've seen uh, the proliferation actually of a, a number of um um ideas for resolving smaller value claims um uh one actually developed here in singapore was something called scribe uh which was the is for disputes of 50000 or or less done in a strict time limit um and um uh a very small number of papers that can be introduced by either side um uh and you can see a uh, a kind of melding between expert determination and um uh, the more evaluative uh, approach uh expert evaluation is used quite a lot in some aspects of shipping like shipbuilding and so on following um the success of expert determination in the construction industry and so i, I seen i see a, a melding of the two Ex- experts um when they make their decision is typically binding mediation isn't binding unless you come to an agreement of course um but uh i would say that the the business relationship that uh, was mentioned uh, earlier on whether it's a small or la- large mediation is key and i would like to say that it is a cliche but it's absolutely true that uh, you can preserve and in fact i have personally seen relationships being built and improved as a result of a successful mediation where you will shake hands at the end of it as opposed to Uh, an arbitration or court case where very rarely do people shake hands um so uh i've seen that the other point i would make um bazul is that um frequently if you do have an intractable 
series of issues, you can always choose to mediate one or two issues um, and leave the rest for the more formal setting of arbitration or court case. I've seen that ex very recently. In fact, we here at uh, BW, we finalized a mediation of that ilk only yesterday where um, liability and quantum uh, were different. Um, one was dealt with by mediation, the other wasn't. Um, so you can be quite creative in the way you use mediation. It doesn't have to resolve all issues. It can just solve some. And that can be a, a larger mediation forum or the smaller ones. Excellent. Creative use of mediation. That's the tagline. Creative use of mediation. I think it's, it's extremely important to be flexible. Um, and so, and, you know, I, I did say I want to go to the jurisdiction experts. Uh, before I do that, I want to maybe, uh, we may, uh, because it's a, it's a challenge posed to the institution, isn't it, we may. Uh, so, if you take a, uh, an a inflexible approach as a mediator, is not going to work. You need to look at the issues at play, cause, relationship, and in a maritime dispute, unlike other sort of dispute, they are technical in nature, uh, largely issue driven. So you heard from Nick, these are all at play and, and he used the word creative mediation. I want to hear from you, uh, you know, do you have that, the creative mediation, the ability to creatively put together a process? I think it's not just, it's not just solution. I think key is process. If you get the process right, the solution follows. If you get the process wrong, sometimes you don't get the right solution. So I want to hear from you, do you have it? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Bazoo. And, and that's a very good way to put it. And I really like the way that Nick has, has talked about how you can separate issues and you can try to have some small wins maybe at a, at a start. And then that might lead to bigger wins or you can leave that to arbitration. So here in SIMC, we're all about being creative in uh, solutioning the, 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 the problem itself. So let me just give a few examples. Um, we have what is called a joint protocol with uh, JIMC, uh, Japan International Mediation Center. And what we have done is we have said that for certain cases, because of cultural differences, languages, et cetera, it may be a good idea to have two mediators rather than one. So that's just one process creativity that would put it. And we introduced that sometime in January or February of this year, of course, with COVID and it's online, it's relatively inexpensive. And you get one mediator that is out of Japan because one of the parties is Japan and one from an international um, um, panel. And we had our first case sometime in March. Um, and our first case was a brilliant success, happy to say, because we were able to use the two mediators, um, cultural ability, language ability, considering it's Japan, um, to able to, to be able to set aside what we considered to be a three-day mediation. We had several pre-mediation before that. And guess what? By the second day, it was, it was settled. It was that effective. Set aside three days, done in two. Um, and, and again, that is just an example of how mediation can be as creatively, uh, can be as creatively managed as you want to be. It is about creating a bigger pie at the end of the day. You think about an arbitration award or a, a court um, award from a judge, there are certain limitations of what the court can do, can award. There are certain limitations as to what the arbitrator can award as well. They're always concerned about reviews, et cetera, et cetera. So whilst in a mediation, there's always the possibility of bringing in a third party, bringing in the, uh, the insurers, bringing in potential future deals, bringing in the fact that there is um, other uh, relationships of the parties. Um, there's a possibility of helping in other areas other than the, than the, the, the actual um, 
dispute itself. We have an IP dispute that helped to look at infringement products in other areas, other than exact, you know, other than the actual um, uh, infringement itself. So it expands the pie for everyone. And you are basically renegotiating a way that is beneficial to both parties. So all of that we put in place to help the parties to find the best solution possible for that particular case. And, and, and as I speak, uh, and, and I mentioned this to, to the panel before, as we speak here, and it's not by design, we have a maritime mediation going on right now, 100 meters uh, away from where I'm sitting. And, and I'm keeping track of how, how it is going. And, and I'll tell you, it's so exciting because you know, it, it changes um, as, as you go along, right? As you go along. And, and, and the important thing is the mediator stays very flexible, culturally sensitive, have the ability to connect the parties, build the rapport, and help the parties to come to a solution that is truly win-win for both. And that, that to me is the best thing. Riming, I'm not sure whether you were present in a chat we had with uh, uh, mediators from some other jurisdiction. One said to me or us, if you were there, that, you know, he then, uh, sorry, when he is sitting as a mediator or he's involved in a mediation, or at least he knows another mediator who invites parties to Hawaii to mediate. Yes, you, yes, you're, yes, you're nodding yes. your head. That's yes, right. I was in that one. Yes. yes. So, uh, you know, <laughs> he fixes three, four days, but he insists on parties coming to Hawaii. Yes. You and know, I volunteered, I said it. Never. That you was did, one of the things. I, I, I'll be there. <laughs> you did. You did. And I'm sure you would be called on. I hope you will be called on. But, you know, the point really is, I thought it was amazing because it gives an incentive to those who are making a decision to settle as quickly as possible and then enjoy what Hawaii has to offer. <laughs> Nick, how is that for creativity? <laughs> I, I, now, I, think, I think, you know, talking about Hawaii, I, I did ask a, a friend who's been all over the world and he says that, and I asked him, where would you want to go? And he said, Hawaii for sure. I said, why? Because he says, he says this, the only place in the world that when a plane lands, everyone claps because they are so happy to be there. <laughs> I'm sure some of you would have experienced that as well. So that's Hawaii. I mean, it puts people in a different perspective, a different mode, and that's the collaboration that we want to create. Now, Mr. Asha, now you heard about creative and what SIMC is doing. Now, you have vast amount of experience um, in the Indian subcontinent and those users. So uh, you tell me, what do we need to take on board? What do your users want uh, in terms of mediating with us in SIMC? What, what are you looking for? You, you're muted. Yeah, th thanks, thanks, Vazun. Uh, ordinarily, if somebody would ask me, what's a good time? my instinctive response is always no better time than today. But when it comes to litigation, uh, timing plays an important role. Yes. So uh, we need to make sure that uh, the timing for mediation, timing for litigation, everything is well thought through. Decisions are taken after having anticipated the possible response from the other side, possible potential orders that could be passed, and then initiate your move. The waving of white flag, what we initially discussed, is also a, a, a key thing, and that's one of the beliefs, or that's one of the understanding here in subcontinent, that if you take the initial step of waving a, or getting in for mediation, you are waving a white flag, flag to the whole thing. So in my view, uh, a mix of a hybrid mix of arbitration, mediation, arbitration is the way forward. And timing needs to be seen as to what time we come and uh, get into mediation. Because often uh, uh, in contested litigations, what happens is there are parties in position, parties in a better position 
situation and for them to negotiate or mediate from that position uh, is a different as it's an advantageous position so the key is how best we are able to ensure that our clients or or the party here is put on a level playing field and then you get into mediation now uh, what would we look from india as a perspective for having a a, a good mediation first of all a, a domain expert is the key thing secondly the question invariably is the uh, the biasness like when a third party or a or a third party is appointed as a mediator there is an element of fear doubt which tingles around in the minds of uh, a domestic player so we need to ensure that the ethical standards the impeccable integrity neutrality rules are followed because in india it's a vast nation and every i would say 500 kilometers the culture changes the language changes so otherwise a neutral behavior or a fair behavior would be viewed with some kind of a doubt in the minds of asians so in my view to make a mediation a successful we need to have a very strict rules which ensures ethical standards impeccable integrity and neutrality as also understanding the roles and understanding the culture of the parties where they are coming from third thing is cost effectiveness uh, it's it's a subset to arbitration so cost is a big concern so that element should be borne in mind and last thing is there should be a finality to the dispute because uh, in most of the jurisdiction abroad you have uh, conciliation and mediation used as an alternative uh, or interchangeable terms in india both are different the conciliation is different and which covers under the indian arbitration and conciliation act whereas mediation does not come under any specific statute so ensuring conclusiveness to the mediation now it's in a hybrid form it attains finality so though india is a signatory to the convention still the ratification is to take place so as an interim measure the key is that we should uh, ensure that there is cost effective finality to a dispute so these are the few points i feel from an indian perspective uh, which will play a important role in getting into mediation exceedingly helpful uh, mr ashok thank you so much because you raised so many important and uh, very useful points timing domain expertise make sure there's no biases cost effectiveness and possibility so it's, it's brilliant now i want to turn to miss young uh miss young uh, you heard what mr asha has said in terms of uh, from the indian jurisdiction and uh, what are your thoughts in in terms of the chinese users what what are they expecting from us uh, yes thank you mr bazo uh, um yes from china's pers- perspective i think um uh, the mediation is still at a very initial stage um in many times this view resolution uh, either litigation or arbitration or just uh, a uh, settlement negotiation between the parties directly um the hybrid mechanism is not common to see in china um because for many according to my experience many chinese companies they not familiar with the mediation rules or how this process is is work so uh, of course the cost saving and uh, efficiency is is of well the is advantages comparing with the arbitration and litigation but sometimes they may also consider <clears throat> the the result of the mediation uh, whether they can uh, reach agreement uh, because uh, the mediation is subject to the the parties agreement 
So um, if if the, finally if the mediation fail, so for them maybe they spend more time in the course uh, rather than to directly to go to the the arbitration or litigation. Uh, but I think um, in my view, uh, for some small venue cases, I think both parties would have the intention to go to the mediation uh, because it's cost saving, it's all else. <clears throat> but uh, for the large menu cases or some complicated cases like the shipbuilding cases, uh, I think it's, it's depends on the case. It depends on uh, whether the case is straightforward or whether the, the, the prospects of the case is clear. Yeah, if it's clear, I think both, for both parties, they may also have the intention to, to go to the mediation, uh, especially after the, you know, the, the exchange of the documents, exchange of evidence, at that point, I think for both parties, may they have already have the clear prospects of the case. So at that time, I think to invite the mediation procedure is a, is a good time. So uh, for both parties, and also uh, may have the more successful result. So I, I believe in the future, um, because the China has joined the, the Singapore Convention of Mediation, so uh, mediation would be used more and more in the future as a, as a way of uh, dispute resolution because the enforcement is not a problem anymore. And we, so for some maritime cases uh, and some shipping contracts, I think we can suggest clients to, to conclude the mediation clause agreement in the contract or uh, have the combined or uh, agreement like the pre arbitration uh, procedure because we already seen in the uh, construction fields uh, the pre arbitration uh, procedure is, is, is quite common to see like the expert mediation. So for some maritime disputes, especially shipbuilding uh, disputes, shipbuilding contracts, I think. Um, uh, using the hybrid mechanism of mediation and arbitration, uh, it will be more welcomed in the future. Yeah, that's my perspective. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, it's interesting. Um, so first, knowledge of uh, hybrid mechanism. In fact, for that matter, mediation itself as a way to resolve dispute. Uh, needs to be uh, spread in relation to the Chinese users. That's the impression I have. Punit, Weiming, you have quite a bit in your hands. I'm sure you would meet the task head on after this session. I'm, I'm quite sure of that. But, you know, uh, Ms. Yang, yes. culturally speaking, I, I would have thought um, we as from coming from this Asian continent, whether it's the Chinese or the Indian, and, and, and I work with Chinese clients uh, quite a bit, the adversarial process is not that welcome uh, <laughs> because it's very intrusive. And culturally speaking as well, I would have thought that mediation is something which would be more welcome, uh, even from the... Chinese perspective. And you know, I, I say this because I have uh, had occasions where I've been involved or at least heard on some occasions where it is the, the commonality of a, uh, an arbitrator in, in, in the Chinese arbitration acting as a mediator having a discussion with the parties. And in fact, in fact, on some occasions, maybe just meeting with one of the parties, uh, having a chat, a friendly chat, and working out 
and finding how best to work out a settlement and trying it's his level best to settle the matter and this is where i suppose for the non chinese uh, user it becomes a slightly troubling uh, is when a set a matter is not settled then he takes on the role as an arbitrator again uh so i can understand from the chinese users perspective and i i think it is it is perfectly understandable because this is a man they trust is entirely they trust him to act honorably so if he goes and has a dinner with one party the other party is going have, would have absolute trust that he is not going to do them over uh if you i mean if you like i mean um for want of a less abusive expression uh that he will do his best to act honorably and settle so i can understand from a chinese users perspective um so is that is that something which is common i mean i mean you heard what i had to say about how it can be troubling for the non chinese user uh, from your experience can you can you tell me a bit about that yes yes i think um different companies will have different concerns about the mediation i think the first uh, problem is many from the chinese user perspective they don't familiar with the mediation and uh, some lawyers as well i think chinese lawyers yeah so they don't know how to just to their clients how to uh, use the 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 mechanism to to solve the dispute how to effectively to use the mechanism so sometimes if the the companies if there's no good prospects of the case or of the mediation so i don't think the the, the final result is the 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 parties will have no strong intention to go for the mediation so sometimes for the chinese lawyers they may not able to persuade their clients to go for the mediation and another issue i i met is that for some chinese company especially national companies uh, i think the problem for them is they they hard to make decision uh, for the mediation because uh you know for the for them they should have the basis to make any offer or make any settlement uh, offer they should have the 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 basis or how uh, they can settle the case instead of to wait for a, a award or judgment yeah so that is also a actually problem which we need to solve uh, for the other Uh, Chinese users, or for or for some uh, not national company, for them, uh, I think the they will consider the 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 the, the cost and time. Yeah, of course uh, we can persuade them. They that's if we go for mediation, uh, of course it would be more efficient and cost saving, comparing with the uh, litigation and arbitration. Uh, So so for them I think the mediation would be more welcome yeah okay uh it's 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 another important point came up um uh, you know the more i hear uh from experience it seems to me that these are problems not just in a particular jurisdiction it's a problem um or challenge if you if you if you like the a better choice of word in the at least in the asian context one challenge which you posed which i thought was very interesting um is that if you're dealing with a national company there is a problem with the suggestion of a mediation because a national company those who are behind decision making don't want to make decision <laughs> because if you make a decision then you will lose your job <laughs> and if you settle there is also the ugly stain that 
you may be corruptible and that's why you reach a settlement comes in so uh, so in a national company the challenge is slightly different in the sense that you need to persuade the users that hang on uh, it is um, not you but it is this is where i suppose institutions come in a reputable institution uh, the need for a reputable institution comes in and uh, mr asher i mean before i go on with enforcement i want to touch on enforcement before i i i, I, I give my, the floor back to my friend punit in terms of q and a uh, but before i go on to enforcement i i want to i want to unpick this with uh, mr asher mr asher uh, you have affected for many government undertaking in fact you have acted for the government uh on 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 various very large stake uh disputes as well as corporate uh, matters so what i want to hear from you is uh is that is that real i mean in terms of the government undertakings uh are they likely to say to you uh no i am not going to sign up to this mediation to to use the phrase let the law takes its course uh that's that's a common phrase uh which i sometimes hear uh is that something real because i want to you know my friends weeming and punit they need to understand the challenges so they they can properly uh deal with the challenges in terms of making sure that the mediation is successful so why don't i hear from your mouth as to is that a real problem yes bazul uh, there would be an element of uh, resistance coming from government departments government companies but somehow i feel over period of time their mindset to is changing like back in india we have east to do business wherein decisions are now being taken by government bodies at a pretty brisk pace and once we are able to explain to the clients that mediation is a, a viable way or a, or a mode by, whereby a quick disposal take place and back it up with some kind of uh, strong opinion uh, governments uh, should not have a problem a government company should not have a problem in uh, conceding to going for mediation uh, as a as a matter of fact we have section 89 of our civil procedure code which also in its uh, spirit gives power to the courts that in appropriate forums to refer the matter to mediation conciliation arbitration and the objective of the same is to see that there are quick disposal to the whole process so 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 long as uh, uh, to conclude so long as there is transparency there is backing with legal uh, residents in mind uh, i think government organizations back in india would be uh, would be comfortable and uh, keen to settle quick disposal matters uh, having quick disposal of yes so punit beaming uh may i urge you uh even uh, sorry after this session um as soon as possible to engage miss yang and mr asher as to what you can do in order to um uh, get more users in china and uh and india to take up including the government national um uh undertakings if you like yeah i want to go to the question of uh, enforcement because i think it's important uh before we go on to the q and a uh, prakash uh you know the singapore convention you heard from uh, mr asha it's not ratified yet and hopefully it would be ratified soon uh, we have an excellent excellent ministry uh and i met some of them who is trying to make sure that there would be ratification and and beaming knows that as well they're working so hard 
uh, and, um, and and I'm sure that it will the take up would be there. And what I want to get some clarity on uh, from you, Prakash, is uh, how does enforcement work for Singapore Convention? I understand that if it is a, if it is a consent award, the hybrid resolution seems like a good way. Uh, but there may be situations where the parties to the arbitration may not want to have a consent award against them. Uh, they rather have it settled and behave honorably uh, and meet up to those expectations. Uh, where you have a party defaulting, uh, how does the Singapore Convention comes in to assist enforcement? Can you, can you, can you brief us on it? Sure, Bazo. So, prior to the Singapore Convention, uh, parties would have had to go through the additional step of first uh, commencing proceedings to sue on the breach of the mediated settlement agreement um, as a fresh cause of action, obtain judgment on the, uh, that fresh cause of action, and then only after that is done, then commence enforcement proceedings uh, in other jurisdictions, for example. Um, uh, and, but with the introduction of the Singapore Convention, what it does is that it paves the way for that mediated settlement agreement uh, to be enforced uh, immediately across borders amongst the countries that are parties to the treaty. Um, and you said that what if the party is not, uh, uh, what if the country is not a party to the, the treaty yet? Then what would happen is, so for example, in Singapore, you would record that uh, mediated settlement agreement as an order of court and then you would look to the reciprocal treaties that are available in Singapore uh, to enforce it overseas. So for example, under the REFJA, uh, you would be able to uh, enforce it in, uh, for example, uh, um, Australia, Hong Kong, Malaysia, uh, Sri Lanka, United Kingdom. And the other thing that you can look to is as well is the Hague Convention on Choice of Court Agreement, uh, where you would be able to enforce a Singapore judgment uh, in the EU, for example. Uh, of course, uh, the best way would be to, to, to uh, record it as a consent award, which would then open up the, the 168 uh, countries under the New York Convention. Yes, very helpful. Uh, maybe I want to say um, something more in terms of the enforcement before I hand over the proceedings to Punit, because I, I, I see that there are several questions, uh, which is a reflective that this session has been interesting. Um, now, um, in terms of enforcement, I think the users need to have two things in mind. One is to have the mediation take place in a jurisdiction which has friendly treaties with other jurisdictions so that if something is recorded, you can use the treaty to enforce what is recorded in that other jurisdiction where the enforcement needs to take place. And this is, this is so important. Uh, the second thing is, when you're looking at enforcement, the intuitive thing is to look at where the party against whom the enforcement takes place resides. But that's not the only jurisdictions to enforce. What you ought to look at is, as well, is where the assets sit. Uh, we, are living, we are living in a modern world, globalization, where a party sits in one jurisdiction, where there is capital control, uh, currency control. So the assets sometimes don't sit there. In fact, the asset sits in jurisdictions where there is no currency control. For example, Hong Kong, Singapore, UK, US, where there is an ease of movement of funds. 
so when you are looking at enforcement, you also look at where the assets sit. Uh, so that's those are two things which I wanted to say over what you have said, Prakash. Punit, uh, there are questions coming in fast and furious. I suspect you have 15 minutes. Can I leave you to uh, distribute the question to who you think most fit to answer it? Thank you so much, Bazul. I think, as you rightly said, there's definitely a lot of interest in, in uh, the discussions. And obviously, the questions reflect that. Um, actually, I can start with one from YK Chan, who is uh, a member of SCMA as well. And he has, uh, he has actually got a question on enforcement, which is, uh, which is kind of continuing the string, string that you just mentioned just now. Um, and he, of course, accepts the fact that the hybrid uh, resolution method works. But he says quite a number of parties refuse honor the settlement agreement or consent award. Therefore, I'm concerned about the enforceability of such consent award. It is certainly no problem at the seat of arbitration. I'm not sure about other jurisdiction. He says he heard from a representative of PRC Arbitration Commission that under an institutional arbitration PRC, to, uh, it, it is, hold on, just, just one question that he had. I think he mentioned that question. It was, if, if the, if the uh, mediation or the hybrid uh, mechanism is not written into the contract, then enforcement of that would not be possible in the courts. That means you cannot go ahead and, uh, and bring in a hybrid uh, solution and then ask for an enforcement. If your parties have not agreed it in the contract, they bring it post-contract stage. Is that enforceable in PRC? So Ms. Young, maybe you can comment on that, saying that if you bring a hybrid resolution mechanism into the contract or into the uh, discussion after the contract is agreed, post-contractual stage, is that going to be enforceable by the courts if a mediation has been settlement has been agreed by the parties? What is the, the PRC view on that? Uh, yes, the, the mediation award of a mediation agreements concluded uh, in China, it can be enforced uh, by the court if it's uh, uh, comply with the convention, you know, but now the uh, the Chinese are still making the specific provisions of the uh, to imp implement the convention. So we still waiting for the uh, the specific rules for how to comply with such uh, convention, how to how to enforce the word. Yeah, but since now China has joined the convention, so uh, I believe uh, it's soon that's specific rules will, will come out. So I think it would be similar to the foreign occupation award, the process, yeah. Like the, the New York Convention, the, the enforcement, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, that's very useful. Maybe this question is for- uh, you, know, you don't mind, you know, I mean, just add a little bit to that. Yep, please, Ming Ming. Yes, right. thank, thank you. Thank, thanks, thanks, Ms. Yang. I, I, I was in, uh, I lived in China for 20 years, uh, practicing there in-house, and it's, it's a real pleasure to, 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 to also see how uh, mediation is developing. One point I just want to add is that in SIMC, we have a protocol with the Sunshine Court of International Arbitration. Um, and that protocol specifically allows mediated agreement in SIMC to be registered as an arbitral award in SCIA, in the Sunni Court of International Arbitration, um, even though there's been no arbitration before that. And the power of that is that it would then allow that arbitral award to be enforced in China. Um, it was a, 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 a very interesting protocol that was signed just last year. And, and then anyone who is online who's interested in that, we're happy to provide more information. In fact, when we talk to many of our partners who have businesses in China, they're very keen on that because it means an additional protection uh, in addition to New York Convention, of course, but this uh, is coming through the Syngian Court of uh, International Arbitration. That's very interesting. Yeah. That's yes, very yes, interesting. yes. If the mediation is, is, uh, is uh, it's made during the arbitration, yes. The, it can be converted to the arbitration award, and then the arbitration award can be enforced in China. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is even if we, even if before you went to arbitration, that was why we had need, we needed to have the special protocol 
that that was why it's a little different. So okay. quite 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 novel. And uh, to Mazu's point, being creative to create okay. new new avenues to uh, enforce uh, these mediation awards in China. Thank you. Right. Uh, Mr. Chan has just uh, sent another one saying he would like to supplement that the party challenging the consent award enforceable in other jurisdiction is based on procedure, not in the original agreement, which is exactly what uh, Ms. Yang, you mentioned as well. So I just want to clarify that. We, Meng, I'll continue with you. You actually have uh, uh, agreed to answer this question, which I think is perfect from uh, Mr. Nung from uh, from Vietnam. Is co-mediators with different backgrounds suitable for maritime disputes? Uh, there you go. Something which I think you can share your experience for sure on a very interesting question. Yeah. Thank you. So, so precisely is because they have different backgrounds that we have co-mediation. So we do not appoint two co-mediators who are exactly the same or have the same background. We, we would um, uh, curate the mediators in a way to take full advantage of the two having different background, different expertise, um, different cultural uh, 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 understanding, language ability, um, and even sometimes one from law, one not from the law, um, one from the business, um, an accountant, we have an accountant and a lawyer coming together. So, so the reason is because when you have the full scale and range of the skill, the ability, the ability to connect, the ability to focus on process and technical, which is actually quite different. That's where you give the, the mediation the best option of, of meeting the party's uh, needs, of communicating with them in a powerful way that really address their interests. And that's where you can find settlement. Interesting. Yep. Thank you so much. This is uh, very useful. Uh, Donna Ross was asking if the arbitration begins before mediation, can a party have access to an emergency arbitrator, but without terminating the mediation? I'm not sure how that would be procedurally uh, possible. Uh, would one of the practitioners be able to answer that? Or Weeming, do you have any idea on this particular part? Can you actually have an access to an emergency arbitrator without terminating the mediation? Is that even possible? Uh, from my perspective, not, not an issue at all. We've had situations where the parties do agree to a pause of, in, in the case of um, Ahmed Ab, is usually eight weeks, which is actually not very long if you think about it, even in the case of an emergency. Um, and the reason why I guess you want an emergency is probably to freeze assets, you know, some of these procedural uh, aspects you want to put, put in place. I don't see a problem with the parallel uh, processes going on at the same time, but of course you do need the consent of the parties, which, um, which um, may be an issue if you do have one party that doesn't agree to it. So that's the only problem that I think there is. But if both sides agree to the mediation and you do have this expedited process that's going on, it, it, I don't think it's an issue, but even if it is, it is a pause of eight weeks, which really is, is just a, a, a short uh, um, postponement of uh, the process. Absolutely. Yeah, and that I, is the... Yeah, I, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, could it, Can I just say this? Because I think the question Ms. Ross asked was, um, is can we appoint an emergency arbitrator without disrupting the mediation process? So, of course, it's procedurally possible and as Viming has said, it is it's party autonomy which kicks in. But I, I, I thought I wanted to say this. Uh, you see, the mediation, uh, it depends very much on the goodwill of the parties. I suspect uh, you are going to put a big wedge in the goodwill if you're going to run with the emergency arbitrator and get a freezing order or other emergency measures, which sometimes would have to call on the other party's credibility. So my response to Ms. Ross is, if you want to do that, then do the emergency arbitrator first. Once you get that emergency arbitrator order, then you start the mediation. So that's what I would say. And I thought that's what uh, intuitively uh, Weeming assumed and then went on to speak about that as a procedure. 
And if I may add, Bazu, sometimes after you've got a freezing order, the other side will be much more willing to come to the table to, 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 to find a solution. So, you know, it's all tactical. <laughs> of course, of course. Absolutely. That's the reality. Um, there's a question from Prasanna. V, to initiate mediation, should the mediation clause be included in the agreements or is it not necessary? So obviously I can answer that from my side that the model on the SCMA side is, is that, yes, you would probably be preferable to include a charter party clause, which is available on our website and, and in the model clauses. But that is not an essential thing. I think, Bazul, you yourself mentioned that right away in the beginning, that you can always, given the model, bring in mediation or weave in mediation at a later stage if the parties agree. But having a clause helps in the psychology and the weakness perception, which we talked about in detail earlier in the beginning. So if anybody else has anything else to add, uh, please go ahead. But I think it's not necessary to have it in the contract, but it's preferable to have it in the contract. I can just add that uh, in the event, the arbitration is to be governed by the Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act. There is no need for having a specific mediation clause because clause 30, section 30 of the Arbitration Act gives the power to the arbitrators to make a reference to mediation. So, so it again depends on uh, by what law the arbitration is to be governed or the charter party is to be governed. If it is Indian Arbitration Act, there is no specific requirement for incorporating a special mediation. Okay, that's um, very useful. Go ahead. Uh, you know, I have... Uh, Fortunately, fortunately, I have a vast experience in uh, resolving dispute in Asia, um, and in particular, India and China. Um, now, can I urge those participants who are who are in who can play a role in advising their clients to incorporate contracts or clients who are joining in to? Uh, to incorporate a contract, uh, a provision in their contract to provide for hybrid. I, I do understand that you don't need it. And I, in myself, when I was uh, introducing and um, I did say that it's designed, one should keep their minds open even if it's not incorporated. And Mr. Asher said that, look, I mean, you don't even need it uh, if it's the act. But the reason behind my urging parties is this. You know, when we are dealing with Asian counterparts, there is sometimes uh, a, a need to stick to what is in the contract. Uh, flexibility is not often encouraged, especially again when you're dealing with a public undertaking, a government undertaking. It is very difficult to go to a decision maker and say to the decision maker, we need to depart from the contract and let's try mediation. The buy-in is not going to be there. So it, life becomes a lot easier if you introduce the hybrid clause into the contract. So I urge all parties who are listening in to please uh, encourage the users from in incorporating such a clause. That's what I wanted to say, Puneet. Absolutely. And it's a very vital point. And I think it's uh, something that I second for sure. I think it helps a lot. As I said, it's something which must be uh, tried to put in the contract as much as possible. There's another question from Prasanna, which says, if the success rate is less for mediation process, then the cost will be more for arbitration, including the mediation cost on the mediation that did not work out, for example. How this could be amortized in the whole resolution process also, how evolved is this hybrid process today? So, I mean, I, I can start by saying that, yes, this, this is something that you obviously feel that um, the mediation would be a good way of resolving the problem. I think the more than the cost part of it, it's the fact that you can resolve the issue without uh, negatively impacting the business relationships is a huge advantage. Uh, that needs to be taken into consideration and only cost doesn't need to be taken into consideration when you consider hybrid. Um, so amortizing it, yes, you do take a chance and sometimes it doesn't work or works. But at the end of the day, I think that 
win-win situation is only because of the fact that the the hybrid solution provides you with an ability to preserve relationships in the best possible manner along with that um so that's my point uh, i'm sure weeming you want to add something in there as to how mediation if it doesn't if it's not successful how it still adds some value to the whole process of resolving the issue i would say yeah Th thanks sir um, i would like to just uh, point out what nick was saying earlier that really the cost of the mediation is a fraction of the dispute itself um and and invariably for us our success rate is about 70 to 80% in SI MC and we are very uh, pleased with that very grateful for that 70 to 80% is quite a hard uh, percentage to try to maintain but we've been able to do that and for the parties that are able to resolve it it's great 70 to 80% even for the 20 to 30% who do not get a resolution invariably they find benefits of that um of of having being able to sit across each other and uh, and bouncing off ideas and and finding a solution um and and i would like to quote uh, uh, uh some somebody who said to me a uh, uh, a partner from kim and chang who said to me and kim and chang one of the law, biggest law firm in in korea she said that she found that even when the parties don't succeed in a mediation it her experiences that they found that when they actually get the award they are better able to accept that award and i found it odd why is that so why is it that when they are able to when they do not agree they are able to find um the award more palatable it's because they have tried their best to resolve the issue if they have given a better offer and the other side re reject they'll say see serves you right i gave you a better offer at mediation you don't take it you get a bad uh, arbitration against you for the other side if they had a better offer at mediation and they didn't take it they will say oh i miss a better offer serves me right <laughs> i should have taken the offer and i learned from it so i sure. think what what the lawyer was telling me from kian chang is that is a really good way to really test it out and be able to um find that 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 possible the possibility and the positiveness of it uh in a uh, in uh mediation even if it's not successful nick i don't know whether you want to add to that yeah i i i would actually and i think the premise behind the question uh was almost about success rates and i completely agree from what i've seen and read academic and practical the 75 to 80% success rate is uh, is the case and it begs the question isn't it stupid not to try mediation when it's got such an incredible success rate um i really firmly believe that and in fact a wider point is that um in my opinion um every successful mediation improves the reputation and respect of the law generally um that's really the yes absolutely point. Thank you so much. Um I think we are nearly running out of time. I would request Bazul to you know put in some closing remarks uh, to bring the panel discussion to a close and then I will end the session with my thank you to all the people involved. Uh, so Bazul over to you for your closing remarks. Thank you. Um you know I mean why don't I start with uh, what Nick said? Isn't it stupid not to um adopt mediation? in all disputes if not most of the disputes you know the reason why it's not done is what the reasons uh, quite similar to what mr asher raised the problems uh raising a white flag we 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 discussed all that and i and i think um that would also be a change um in the way lawyers resolve disputes we are and and judges as well and the stakeholders basically uh we will be more driven to find a resolution to the client's problem as opposed to just uh approaching it with, it with a one track mind whether it's litigation whether it's arbitration just running the cost the pleadings are due the witness statements are due let's go and get an award i am of the view that in the future you are going to the ones who are going to be truly successful 
in terms of growing their practice and stickiness with their client is one who can truly resolve the client's dispute as quickly, effectively preserving relationship. So you will find a new breed of uh, dispute resolution practitioners who adopt that approach. So I think mediation will take its place um, as a very serious player. Um, and I think, and I said this to Weeming in my private chat with him, I said that it's just a question of time. You are going to find specialist mediation counsel. And I do this. Uh, I think mediation is not a poorer cousin. You need to adopt skill sets, not just to be a mediator, but to be a mediation counsel. So what does that mean? Just, just to give one example, and then I, I'll, I'll wrap it up. When I am acting as a mediation counsel, I don't speak to the mediator at all. Because there's no point in engaging the mediator because the mediator is not the one who is deciding. Unlike an arbitrator, I need to persuade him. Unlike a judge, I need to persuade him. In a mediation, who I need to persuade if I am going to get a settlement is the opposite side client. Not his lawyer. The opposite side client. And I can tell you, it's extremely difficult to be unreasonable when you are meeting someone locking eyes and when the chap is being honest and reasonable in the way he is delivering his message. You can be unreasonable over the phone. You can be unreasonable over emails, maybe even video conferences. But it is extremely difficult to be unreasonable when you're sitting across the fella. And he, when he's saying to you, it is in your interest that you settle this. So as a med I, I think there will be a specialized mediation councils who will be trained to advocate mediation. And I'm of the view that mediation will play a significant role, as I have said it. So, and, and one more point I want to make is, even if there's no settlement, in my experience, there's a 75, 80% chance that I settle the cases where I am involved in mediation. Even if there's no settlement, what I find, Nick, is the issues are crystallized. So when we get on to the disputes, the lawyers focus on the issues or the client focus on the issues. They know what issues which they need to tackle. So when the case starts, it may be 15, 20 issues. After a mediation, it becomes three issues. That in itself is cost saving. So I, I think with that point, I want to hand over to Punit after thanking all of you uh, in joining it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Bazul. And that is a very valid point. Um, I must also mention that uh, the reason why we believe mediation is there to stay is the reason why hybrid mechanisms have been developed and protocols like ARB med -ARB have been developed by CMA. So we are very much a uh, part of this ecosystem. Thank you all so much for to all the amazing panelists for their viewpoints and sharing. Uh, this was a truly enlightening session compare, covering a variety of solutions that uh, Singapore dispute resolution ecosystem has to offer and probably global ecosystem eventually has to offer as well. And I'm sure the audience found it very useful. When I wrote a LinkedIn post to publicize this event, I told them I have a quote which said that once you know where the light switch is, you're never afraid of darkness. And that's exactly what we're doing, right? We are trying to educate and create awareness. Arb Med Arb is a really useful tool when it comes to dispute resolution. And we're so happy that the entire community of lawyers, shipping companies, arbitration and mediation centers are supporting his embracement. I would like to end this event by thanking the Ministry of Law, uh, Minister Edwin Tong SC, our strategic partners, Un and Bazul and SIMC, and all the panelists, and all our supporting organization, Asia Pacific Institute of Experts, China Maritime Arbitration Commission, Maxwell Chambers, Maritime Law Association of Singapore, Singapore Institute of Arbitrators, Institute of Chartered Ship Brokers, Singapore Branch, Singapore Shipping Association, and Vista Singapore. Thank you so much. Your support has been very valuable. I would also like to thank my team, especially Vinny, and also Grace and Ariel from Un and Bazul for working tirelessly to manage this event. 
I leave you now with a QR code to scan and fill out the most important feedback form, which hopefully will give us the ability to do better uh, events in the future. So thank you so very much. Please do give us a feedback by using this QR code. Um, I will be very thankful and I wish you all a very good day and good evening ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank See you, you in, you see you in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> see you in Hawaii. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot.